the Mercury Theater, on the air. Columbia Broadcasting System takes pleasure in bringing you the 12th in its series of weekly broadcasts featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. Tonight, Broadway's and radio's most celebrated theatrical producing company brings to life the best-loved character in detective fiction, the immortal Sherlock Holmes. The play is Orson Welles' own adaptation for radio of William Gillette's enduring melodrama based on the famous stories by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Before the performance begins... Here is the director of the Mercury Theatre, the star and producer of these unique broadcasts, Orson Welles. Good evening. Well, tonight it's back to Baker Street. Back to that unlikely London of the 19th century where high adventure awaits all who would seek it in a handsome cab or under a gas lamp in an Inverness cape. For tonight we pay tribute to the most wonderful member of that most wonderful world, a gentleman who never lived and who will never die. There are only a few of them, these permanent profiles, everlasting silhouettes on the edge of the world. There is first the little hunchback with a slapstick whose hooked nose is shaped like his cap. There is now and always will be the penguin-footed hobo in the derby and the baggy pants, and the small boy with a wooden head, and the long, rusty knight on horseback, and the fat knight who could only procure a charge on foot. There is also the tall gentleman with the hawk's face, and the underslung pipe, and the fore-and-aft cap. We'd know them anywhere and call them easily by name. Punch and the Charlies, Chaplin and McCarthy, Quixote, Sir John, and Sherlock Holmes. Now, irrelevant as this may seem, we of the Mercury Theatre are very much occupied these days with rehearsals for a revival of a fine old American farce. A lot of you will remember, if only for its lovely title, which is Too Much Johnson. Its author was William Gillette, which reminded us, as it reminds you, of Sherlock Holmes. As everybody knows, that celebrated American inventor of underacting lent his considerable gifts as a playwright the indestructible legend of the Conan Doyle detective and produced the play which is as much a part of the Holmes literature as any of Sir Arthur's own romances and as nobody will ever forget. He gave his face to him. For William Gillette was the aquiline and actual embodiment of Holmes himself. It is too little to say that William Gillette resembled Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes looks exactly like William Gillette. Sounds like him, too, we're afraid, and hope devoutly that the Mercury Theater and the radio will take none of the glamour from the beloved fable of Baker Street, from the pipe and the violin and the hideous purple dressing gown, from the needle and the cigar on the window ledge, and the dry, final, famous lines. Elementary, my dear Watson, elementary, the mere child's play of deduction. My name is Watson. I am a doctor. It was in the year 1880 that Holmes and I were introduced by our mutual acquaintance. At the time, we were both looking for a lodging that would suit our moderate means. This we found on the second floor of a house at 221B Baker Street. And it was during the years that we occupied these chambers together that Holmes established his unique international reputation as a consulting detective. During that time, I was privileged to be his daily companion. And I have done my modest share in giving to the world an account of some of his most famous cases. Most famous of these are the ones of which I have written under the names of the Speckled Band, Sign of Four, Hound of the Baskervilles, and A Study in Scarlet. They represent, however, only a minute fraction of the 643 cases Holmes successfully solved during the years that we shared the lodgings in Baker Street. Other cases I hope one day to give to the world include the Tarleton murders, 
the sudden death of Cardinal Tosca, the adventure of Ricoletti of the club foot and his abominable wife, the case of Mrs. Farintosh, the circus bell, and the case of the royal family of Scandinavia. Each illustrate in their own way the remarkable genius of my friend, Sherlock Holmes. Since my marriage three years ago, Holmes has continued to occupy the Baker Street lodgings by himself. And here almost every afternoon when my work in the office is finished, I'm in the habit of calling on him. The sitting room as you go in is exactly as it has been for the past 13 years. The worn, bearskin rug, the huge sofa covered with faded chintz, the mantelpiece cluttered with miscellaneous objects, unanswered letters and piles of loose tobacco. On one side of the fireplace in a deep armchair, his pipe curling forth slow wreaths of acrid tobacco, draped in his hideous purple dressing gown, sits Sherlock Holmes with his violin under his chin. What, my dear How home? are you, Holmes? I'm delighted to see you. Perfectly delighted, upon my word I am, but uh, I'm sorry to observe that your wife has left you. <laughs> she has gone on a little visit. But how did you know? How did I? Well, I like that. How do I know anything? How do I know you've been getting yourself very wet lately, that you're an extremely careless servant girl, that you've moved your dressing table to the other side of the room? Holmes, if you had lived a few centuries ago, they'd have burned you alive. Hmm. Such a conflagration would have saved me a great deal of trouble and expense. Tell me, now, how did you know all that? Hmm. Too simple to talk about. Scratches and clumsy cuts, my dear fellow, on the inner side of your shoe there, just where the firelight strikes it. Scratches, cuts. Somebody scraped away crusted mud and did it badly, badly. Scraped the shoe along with it. There's your wet foot, my dear Watson, and your careless servant girl all on one shoe. Face badly shaved on the right side, always used to be on the left. Light must come from the other side. Couldn't very well move your window, must move the dressing table. <laughs> Of course. But how the deuce did you know my wife was away? Well, where the deuce is your second waistcoat button, Watson? And what the deuce is yesterday's button here doing in today's lapel? And why the deuce do you wear the expression of a... <laughs> oh, marvelous. Elementary, my dear fellow, elementary. The child's play of deduction. I'm only doing it for your amusement before we pass on to more serious matters. Oh, what is it now, Holmes? Watson, my dear fellow, the enthusiasm which has prompted you to chronicle, and if you will excuse my saying so, somewhat to embellish my little uh, adventures... You occasionally seem fit to introduce a certain element of romance which struck me as being uh, just a trifle out of place. Something like working an elopement into the fifth proposition of Euclid. I uh, merely refer to this in case you should see fit at some future time to uh, chronicle the case on which I'm about to embark. The strange case of Professor Robert Moriarty. Moriarty? I don't remember ever having heard of the fellow. No, Watson, you haven't. It's precisely this quality of invisibility that makes of Professor Moriarty the Napoleon of crime. Sitting motionless like an ugly, venomous spider in the center of his web. But that web having a thousand radiations and the spider knowing every quiver of every one of them. And within 48 hours, I'll have the lines drawn so tightly around him that he can't move. I'll arrest him and his entire gang. Why, Holmes, this is a very dangerous... My thing. dear fellow, it's perfectly delightful. My whole life is spent in a series of frantic endeavors to escape from the dreary commonplaces of existence. For a brief period, I escape. You should congratulate me. The day before yesterday, I received in this room the visit of a certain foreign nobleman who has recently inherited a very considerable title and who is about to be married. Seems that this titled gentleman was so indiscreet as to fall in love with a young English lady by the name of Faulkner, uh, socially inferior, and to make her a promise of marriage. Uh, later, at his family's insistence, the thing was broken off, and the young lady died shortly after of a broken heart, leaving behind a sister. Also, considerable evidence in the form of letters, photographs, and jewelry with inscriptions. These the sister kept. These, together with the sister, are now being held in a house in St. John's Wood by a pair of blackmailers who go by the name of Chetwood. So far as you see, my dear Watson, a fairly ordinary case of blackmail hardly worth my attention. Last night... On my inspection, a certain element revealed itself which renders the case far more important than I had expected. And that element was Professor Moriarty. Come in. Beg pardon, Mr. Holmes. Mm, yes, Billy, what is it? Gentlemen, to see you by the name of Foreman. Show him in, Billy. Show him in. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Come in, Mr. Foreman. Mm, good evening, Foreman. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. 
Uh, Watson, this is Inspector Foreman. Since the day before yesterday, he occupies the position of butler under the name of Judson in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Chetwood, uh, blackmailers in St. John's Wood. Well, Foreman, any news? Yes, sir. This morning, a little after nine, Chetwood and his wife drove away in a four-wheeler. They returned about eleven. Bassett was with them. You know him, sir. Mm, yes. When I last had the occasion to meet Mr. Bassick, he got two years for safe-cracking. Go on, Foreman. Well, they took this man Bassick into the library. I got a look at him from the outside. And there he was opening up the safe where they'd been keeping the letters. Go on. In the end, when they got the safe open, it was empty. Hmm. The letters were gone. It seems like the Faulkner girl got them back somehow. That got them pretty excited. Bassick went out to send a telegram. Have we got a copy of it? Yes, yes. Here it is, sir. It's in code. Hmm. Moriarty. I thought so, Watson. This case is taking a most promising turn. Foreman, you return at once to the house at St. John's Wood. In ten minutes, I shall be there myself. If I remember correctly, the kitchen is immediately below the drawing room. Yes. When I knock over a chair in the drawing room, you'll overturn a lamp in the kitchen, scatter smoke balls, and give an alarm of fire. All other instructions remain unchanged. Very good, sir. Hurry, Foreman. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, my dear Watson, begins to look like a most interesting evening. My name is Sherlock Holmes. Whom, whom did you wish to see, Mr. Holmes? Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Chetwood. I had myself announced by the butler on my the way butler? up. Butler? I didn't... Oh, very well. Oh, here he is. Yes, Judson. Miss Faulkner begs Mr. Holmes to excuse her. She is not well enough to see anyone this evening. Uh, will you please hand this card to Miss Faulkner and say that I... I beg your pardon, Mr. Holmes, but it's quite useless, really. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear it. Yes, Miss Faulkner is, I regret to say, quite an invalid. She is unable to see anyone. Her health is so poor. Uh, has it ever occurred to you, Mr. Chetworth, that she might be confined to the house too much? How does that concern you? It uh, doesn't. I simply make the suggestion. Might like to think it over. What's your butler's name? Judson, sir. Uh, very well, Judson. Go on, take my card up. Very good, sir. <laughs> this is really too good. Why, of course, he can take up your card or your note or whatever it is if you wish it so much. I was only trying to save you the trouble. Yeah, thanks. Hardly any trouble at all, send up a card. You know, Mr. Holmes, you interest me very much. Oh, really? On my word, yes. We've all heard of your wonderful methods, the astonishing manner in which you gain information from the most trifling details. Now, I dare say, in this brief moment or two, you've discovered any number of things about me. Uh, nothing of consequence, Mr. Chetwood. I hardly more than ask myself why you were so distressed to see me at this particular moment and what there can possibly be about the safe in the lower part of that desk to cause you such painful anxiety. Yes, very good. Very good indeed. If those things were only true now, I'd be wonderfully impressed. It would be absolutely... Excuse remo- me, sir. Uh, Judson. A message for you, Mr. Chetwood. You'll excuse me, I trust. It's from uh, Miss Faulkner. Well, really. She begs to be allowed to see you, Mr. Holmes. She absolutely implores it. Well, I suppose I shall have to give way. Judson, ask Miss Faulkner to come down to the drawing room. Say that Mr. Holmes is waiting to see her. Very good, sir. Quite remarkable upon my soul. May I ask, if it's not an impertinent question, what message you sent up that could so have aroused Miss Faulkner's desire to come down? Uh, merely if that she wasn't down here in five minutes, I'd go up. Oh, that was it. Yes, quite so. And unless I'm greatly mistaken, I hear the young lady on the stairs. In which case, she has a minute and a half to spare. Alice, uh, that is Miss Faulkner. Let me introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Ah, uh, Miss Faulkner. I'm really most charmed to meet you, although it does look as if you've made me come down in spite of myself, doesn't it? I thank you very much indeed for consenting to see me, Miss Faulkner, but regret to observe that you are put to the trouble of making such a very rapid change of dress. Oh, yes. I did hurry a trifle, I confess. Mr. Holmes is quite living up to his reputation, isn't he, Freddy? Come in. Yes, ma'am. What are you doing here, Judson? I beg pardon, ma'am. I was answering the bell. What bell? The drawing room bell, sir. What do you mean, you blockhead? No one rang the bell. I'm quite sure it was rung, sir. Well, I tell you, it did not ring. Your butler is right, Mr. Chetwood. The 
bell did ring. How do you know? I rang it. What do you want? I want to send my card to the real Miss Faulkner. The real? I said the real Miss Faulkner. Judson. Yes, sir? Holmes. What right have you to ring for servants and give orders in my house? What right have you to prevent my cards from reaching their destination? And how does it happen that you and this woman are resorting to trickery and deceit to prevent me from seeing Alice Faulkner? Through some trifling oversight, Judson, neither of the cards I handed to him has been delivered. Kindly see that this error does not occur again. My orders, ah, sir. Ah, you have orders. I can't say, sir. You were I... told not to deliver my card. What business is it of yours, I'd like to know? I shall satisfy your curiosity on that point in a very short time, Mr. Chetwood. Yes. And you'll find out in a very short time that it isn't safe to meddle with me. It wouldn't be any trouble at all for me to throw you out into the street. Yeah, possibly not, but trouble would swiftly follow such an experiment on your part. It's a cursed lucky thing for you. I'm not armed. Yes, well, Miss Faulkner comes down, you go and arm yourself. Arm myself? I'll call the police. Well, tomorrow I'll do it now. Oh, no, you will not do it now. You will remain where you are until the lady I came here to see has entered this room. What makes you so sure of that? Because you will prefer to avoid an investigation of your suspicious conduct, Mr. James Larrabee. Larrabee? That I'm is not... the name under which you are known to Scotland Yard, I believe, Mr. Chetwood. This lady here is your wife. To you, Judson, you will either deliver that card to Miss Faulkner at once or sleep in the police station tonight. If that is small consequence to me, which you do. Shall I? Shall I go, sir? Go on. Take up the card. It makes no difference to me. Uh, a short time since, Larrabee, you displayed an acute anxiety to leave the room. Pray do not let me detain you or your wife any longer. Take it you prefer to remain while I talk to Miss Faulkner? We do, Mr. Holmes. Ah, glass, Miss Faulkner. This is Mr. Holmes. Yes. You wish to see me? Very much indeed, Miss Faulkner, but I'm sorry to see that you are far from well. Oh, no, I... No? Beg your pardon. What does this mark mean? Oh, nothing. Nothing? No. And the mark here on your neck, plainly showing the clutch of a man's fingers, does that mean nothing also? It occurs to me that I should like to have an explanation of this. Possibly you can furnish one, Mr. Larrabee. How should I know? It seems to have occurred in your own house. What if it did? You'd better understand that it isn't healthy for you or anyone else to interfere with my business. Ah, that is your business. Say that much, at least. Pray be seated, Miss Faulkner. I don't know who you are, Mr. Holmes, or why you are here. I shall be very glad indeed to explain. My business is this. I've been consulted as to the possibility of obtaining from you certain letters addressed to your sister, which are supposed to be in your possession. I cannot give up my sister's letters, Mr. Holmes. There are other things besides revenge. His punishment. Uh, believe me, Miss Faulkner. There is nothing more to say. Good night, Mr. Holmes. But my dear Miss Faulkner... Oh, I'm so sorry. How clumsy of me to turn over this chair. Fire! Fire! Oh, help, help, oh what's help, that? Help, what's help, that? Help. What is what's going on in your house here? Fire! Fire! The lamp, sir. The lamp for the kitchen, sir. It's set off the table and everything down there is blazing, sir. Quick, sir, come down. Come down. Come down. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, don't alarm yourself, Miss Faulkner. There is no fire. No fire? The smoke was all uh, arranged for. Arranged for? What does it mean, Mr. Holmes? It means this, Miss Faulkner. It means that I wanted a package of letters, Miss Faulkner, and that by following your eyes just now, when you thought there was a fire, I discovered that you'd hidden them in the upholstery of this chair. Hmm. Oh, yes. Quite elementary, as you see. And now that they're in my possession, there seems to be no reason for me to remain any longer in this house. Good night, Miss Faulkner. Miss Faulkner. Yes? I... I can't take them, Miss Faulkner. These letters belong to you. I find that I cannot keep them. Unless you can possibly change your mind and let me have them of your own free will. <laughs> I suppose you could. I will therefore return them to you and... Uh, Oh, here's our friend, Mr. Larrabee, returning from the fire. Hello. You've got the letters, have you? Now I suppose we're going to see you walk out of the house with them. On the contrary, you're going to see me return them to their rightful owner. Miss Faulkner, here are your letters. Should you ever change your mind and be so generous, so forgiving as to wish to return these letters to the one who wrote them, you have my address. In any event, rest assured, there will be no more cruelty, no more persecution in this house. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. You are perfectly safe with your property, Miss Faulkner. For I shall so arrange it that your faintest cry of distress will be heard. And if that cry is heard, it will be very unfortunate for those who are responsible. 
As for you, Mr. Larrabee, and uh, you, madame, I beg you to understand that you continue your persecution of that young lady at your peril. Good night. Miss Faulkner, come here, Miss Faulkner. Now, are you going to give me those letters? No, never. Are you going to give me those letters? Oh. Now then. Be careful, Jim. You shut up. Now then, Miss Faulkner. Do you give me those letters, or do I break your arm? <laughs> What's that? Someone knocked on the door. No, it was on that side. Did you call, madam? I think someone knocked, Judson. I'll see you, madam. I beg pardon, madam, but there's no one at the door. Very well, you may go. He's got us watched. What we want to do is to leave it alone. Let the Emperor have it. Do you mean Professor Moriarty? That's who I mean. Once let him get at it, he'll settle it with Holmes pretty quick. Don't you worry a minute. I tell you, Professor Moriarty will get at him before noon tomorrow night. He won't wait long either. And when he strikes, it means death. <laughs> We could. We've done it over and over again elsewhere. Police deployed, men in every doorway. Do this tonight in Baker Street. At nine o'clock, call his attendants out on one pretext or another and keep them out. You understand? I'll see this Sherlock Holmes myself. I'll give him a chance for his life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Notify the Lascar that I may require the gas chamber at Stepney tomorrow night. And have Craig in there at a quarter before ten with his crew. Uh, Tell Larrabee I shall want him to write a letter to Mr. Sherlock Holmes, which I shall dictate. Meet me here at seven. Bassick, place your men at nine tonight for Sherlock Holmes's house in Baker Street. You still go there yourself, sir? I will still go there myself. At this meeting tomorrow night, sir, to get him in the gas chamber. If I fail to kill him in Baker Street... You have him in Swandam Lane. Either way, I have him, Bassett. Two strings to our bow. Two strings, eh, Bassett? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that evening, Holmes and I dined together at Scott's in Piccadilly Circus. After dinner, we went to a concert at Queen's Hall. I can still see him on this particular night of the Moriarty case, well knowing that his life was in peril, sitting beside me in the stalls, wrapped in the most perfect happiness, listening to Sarasati play the violin, gently waving his long, thin fingers in time to the music. <laughs> When 
it was over, he rose, put on his long coat, and started with long steps in the direction of the street. Come, my dear Watson. Go on to Baker Street. I have an idea that very soon we shall be receiving a most interesting visit. <laughs> Out of the Queen's Hall, we hailed a hansom, and as we came down Baker Street, we could see that the light was burning on the second floor of 221B. We went up the dark, narrow stairs. Mr. Holmes. The boy Billy was waiting for us. Mr. Holmes. Yes. What is it? Mrs. Hudson's compliments, sir, and she wants to know if she can see you. No, oh, where is Mrs. Hudson? Downstairs in the kitchen, sir. Uh, my compliments, and I don't think she can. Where she is. She'll be very sorry, sir. Our regret will be mutual. It was most terribly important, sir, being as she wants to know what you'll have for breakfast in the morning. Uh, the same. Same as when, sir? Uh, this morning. But you didn't have nothing, sir. You wasn't here. I won't be here tomorrow. Yes, sir. Was that all, sir? Uh, quite so. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, Mr. Holmes, here's a letter for you, sir, on the table. Delivered ten minutes ago. Hmm. Well, read it, Watson. That's a good fellow. When I put on my dressing gown. Yes. Up. Dear sir. Oh, what's the address's name? Why, uh, James Larrabee. And what has James to say this evening? Dear sir. I, uh, hope he won't say that again. <laughs> I have the honor to inform you that Miss Faulkner has changed her mind regarding the letters, etc., which you wish to obtain, and has decided to dispose of them for a monetary consideration. Mm. If you wish to negotiate, will you be at nine o'clock at the guard's monument at the foot of Waterloo Place? You will see a four-wheeler with wooden shutters to the windows. If you have the cab followed or try any other underhand trick, you won't get what you want. Let me know your decisions. Yours truly, James Larrabee. Mm, mine truly. Well, later, perhaps. What does the fellow mean? Fellow means to sell me a base imitation for a large sum of money of certain letters that he does not possess. I shall probably buy them from him. Now, see if I have the points. Tonight, eleven o'clock, guards monument, cab with wooden shutters, no one to come with me, no one to follow. Or I don't get what I want. Quite right. Ah. But uh, this cab with the wooden shutters. Oh, merely a little device to keep me from seeing where they're taking me. Billy. Yes, sir. Uh, give this to the man. With the uh... woman, sir. Oh, ah, young or old? Look quite young, sir. And you're handsome? Four-wheeler, sir. Mm, you seen the driver before? Yes, sir, but I can't think where. Uh, hand this to the lady, apologize for delay, and look at the driver again. Yes, sir. But, my dear Holmes, you didn't say you would go. But I certainly did. But this fellow means mischief. This fellow means the same. I beg pardon, sir. A message come over from the chemist on the corner to say a man has been hit by a bus. Looks like his leg broke. And would Dr. Watson kindly step over and help till the ambulance oh, comes? Oh, you certainly are going at once. I'll be back in a minute, Holmes. Uh, Billy. Yes, sir. Who brought that message? Boy from the chemist, sir. Oh, yes, of course, but which boy? Must have been a new one, sir. I ain't seen him before. Billy, get down, sir, quickly. Look after the doctor. The boy's gone. There's a man with him. It means mischief. Let me know. Don't stop to come up. Ring the doorbell. I'll hear it. Ring it loud. Yes, sir. My word, Professor Moriarty. You'll be taken from here to the hospital if you keep your hand behind you like that. Oh, that's better. Hmm. In that case, please put your revolver on the table. You evidently don't know me. I think it's quite evident that I do. Uh, pray have a chair, Professor. I can spare you five minutes. I just have to say. Uh, careful. What are you about to do, Professor Moriarty? Look at my watch. I'll tell you when your five minutes is up. It is your intention to pursue this case against me? Uh, that is my intention. To the very end. I regret this. But 
too much on my own account, but on yours. I share your regret, Professor, but solely because of the rather uncomfortable position it will cause you to occupy. May I inquire to what position you are pleased to allude, Mr. Holmes? I refer to the position you will occupy at the end of a rope, Professor Moriarty. Have you the faintest idea that you'd be permitted to live to see that day? As to that, I do not particularly care so that I bring you to see it. You will never bring me to see it. Do you think that I would be here if I hadn't made the streets quite safe in every respect? I could never so grossly overestimate your courage as that, Professor Moriarty. Do you imagine that your friend the doctor and your boy Billy will soon return? What? So, it leaves us quite alone, doesn't it, sir? <laughs> quite alone. So that we can talk the matter over quietly, Mr. Holmes, and not be disturbed. In the first place, I wish to call your attention to a few memoranda which I've jotted down, and which you will find that... Uh, uh, there they are. Look out! Don't do that! Jump down quickly! Your father, where's in that memorandum book you're talking about? I was merely about to take out a small notebook. Well, merely don't do it. I don't want it. I've got one of my own. If you want it, we'll have someone get it for you. I always like to save my guests unnecessary trouble. He observes that your boy doesn't answer the bell. Mm, no, but I have an idea that he will before long. It may possibly be longer than you think, Mr. Holmes. What? That boy? Yes, that boy. Well, at least we'll try the bell once more, Professor. Doesn't it occur to you that he may possibly have been detained, Mr. Holmes? Yeah, it does, Professor. Uh, but it also occurs to me that you're in very much the same predicament, Professor Moriarty. I beg pardon, sir. Someone tried to hold me, sir. Yeah, it's quite evident, however, that he failed to do so. Yes, sir. He's got my coat, sir, but he ain't got me. Billy. Yes, sir. Billy, the gentleman I am carefully pointing out to you with this forty-five desires to have us get us something of his left-hand inside coat pocket. As he's not feeling quite himself today, and the consequence of his trying to do it himself might prove fatal, I suggest you attend to it for him. Yes, sir. Is this it, sir? This gun? Uh, quite so. Quite so. I'll put it on the table. Uh, not there, Billy. On this table, where I can reach it. It's more like it. That's all, Billy. Can I see if he's got another, sir? <laughs> Why, Billy, you surprise me. Perhaps the gentleman's taken the trouble to inform us that he hasn't. When, sir? When he made a snatch for this one. And now, Professor, now that we have your little memorandum book, do you think of anything else you'd like before Billy goes? Any little thing you've got that you don't want? <laughs> so sorry. That's all, Billy. Thank you, sir. Listen, Holmes, to me. On the 4th of January, you crossed my path. On the 23rd, you incommoded me. And now, at the close of April, I find myself placed in such a position through your continual interference that I'm in positive danger of losing my liberty. Mm. Have you any suggestions to make? No, I have no suggestions to make. I have a fact to state. If you don't drop it at once, your life's not worth that. I'm afraid, Professor, that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting more important business. You'll excuse me a moment while I get my pipe off the mantelpiece here. I came here this evening, Mr. Holmes, to see if peace could not be arranged between mm, us. Quite so, quite so. You've seen fit not only to reject my proposals, but to make insulting references coupled with threats of arrest. You've been warned of your danger. You don't heed that warning. Perhaps you'll heed this. Up on your hands, Mr. Holmes. Up with the number eight. Mm. Didn't imagine I'd leave that gun loaded, did you, Professor Moriarty? Here are your cartridges. Well, I didn't suppose you'd want to use that gun again, so I took them out while you were talking and put them in my pocket. You'll find them all there, Professor. Billy! Yes, sir? Can you please show Professor Moriarty the door? Yes, sir. This way, sir. Don't ever say I didn't warn you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, no, no, Professor Moriarty. I never will. Billy, come here. Yes, sir. Billy? Billy, you're a good boy. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You 
You are listening to the Columbia Broadcasting System's presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air in Sherlock Holmes, with Orson Welles in the title role and Ray Collins as Dr. Watson. We pause a moment for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue now with this CBS presentation of Sherlock Holmes, played by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air. It was exactly nine o'clock when Sherlock Holmes left the house in Baker Street. He had given the strictest instructions that no one was to follow him. If there had been no word from him by noon of the following day, we must notify Scotland Yard. I went to the window and looked after him as he went down Baker Street. A tall, thin figure in a grey ulster, walking with long, smooth steps in the direction of Langham Place. There he entered a cab. What are you doing? Light matches here. That's what I'm doing. Chuck it. Why should I chuck it? There might be gas, you fool. There ain't no gas. It's been four days since we had gas in the room. Yeah, I still say there might be gas. Did you check it? Uh, I will. Here goes. Ready? Give her a turn. Yeah, that'll do. Turn her off. Five minutes of that. All your troubles are in. Here. What's that? Bassick. That's right, Craigan. That's you, Leary? Yes, sir. That cave? Yes, sir. Be careful now, your boys. You've got a tough one tonight. We ain't said who, as I've heard. Sherlock Holmes. Oh. You mean that, sir? God's truth. He's going to count him out. Well, if you don't and he gets away, I'm sorry for you, that's all. Jack, the governor's here. Not the governor himself. Professor Moriarty. Shut up. Yes, sir. Got your full group? All here, sir. No mistakes tonight, Cregan. Well, be careful of that, sir. This is Larrabee. Hello. He's in on this job. Hello, Larrabee. Oh. What's that door, Bassick? A small cupboard, sir. No outlet? None whatever, sir. A window? Nailed down, sir. Man might break the glass. If he, if he did, he'd come up against the heavy iron bars outside. Huh. We'll have him tied down before he can break any glass, sir. Uh, you've used it before, eh? Of course, you know it's airtight. Every crevice is sealed, sir. When the men have turned the gas on him, they leave by this door? Yes, sir. We made quite secure. Heavy bolts on the outside, sir. Solid oak bars overall. Let me see how quick you can operate them. Well, they tie a man down, sir. There's no need to hurry. Let me see how quick you can operate them. Leary. Yes, sir. That's good. Open it up. Now, Craig, in. And the rest of you. One thing, remember. Whatever happens, no shooting tonight. Not a single shot. Can be heard in the alley below. First thing is to get his revolver away before he has a chance to use it. Two of you attract his attention in front. The other come up on him from behind and snack it out of his pocket. Then you have him. Arrange that, Craigan. Oh, I'll attend to it, sir. Mr. Larrabee, you understand? We wait for you. I understand, sir. I give you this opportunity to sell him the packet of letters you forged and get what you can for your trouble. A few hundred pounds doesn't interest me, Mr. Larrabee. What I am after is old. I understand, sir. When you've finished and got your money, you whistle. And these gentlemen come in. You hear it. You hear that, Cregan? That's right. And Cregan, at the proper moment, present my compliments to Mr. Sherlock Holmes and say that I wish him a pleasant journey to the other side. Come on, Basic. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night sir. Good night. All right, boys. Clear. When you hear the whistle, in you come. Right you are, sir. Larry. Yes, sir. You get down on the corner below. Let me know when he comes. I will let you know. Well, when you see him driving up, come down the alley and whistle three times. Very good, sir. Here. What's this? Ah! How did you get it? 
What have you been doing since I came up here? Informing the police, perhaps? No. I was afraid he'd come, so I waited. To warn him, I suppose. No. To warn him, yes. You're going to swindle and deceive him, sell him a packet of false letters. I know that. What else are you going to do to him? Mm, wouldn't you like to know? Where are those men who came up here? What men? Three terrible-looking men. I saw them go into the street door. You don't mean these men, do you, Miss Parker? Help! Help! Tie him up, please. Tie him up. Tie him up. Listen, there he is now. What? Holmes? That's him. That's the signal. You won't have time to get her out. Shove her in there, in the cupboard. Yeah, that'll do. In with her. Into the cupboard. Hey, there ain't no lock to this here cupboard. You're know, lock to drive something in there. Here, this knife. This'll hurt. That'll hold up. Now, quick, quick! Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Ah, Mr. Larrabee. <laughs> oh, really? I certainly thought after all this driving about in a closed cab, you'd show me something new. Well, seen it before, have you, Mr. Holmes? Oh, well, a time or two. Now to come to think of it, I nabbed a friend of yours in this place while he was trying to drop himself out of the window. Ed Colvin, the cracksman. Colvin, Colvin, never heard of him before. Well, you certainly never heard of him after. I'm sure of that. Race of counterfeiters used these luxurious chambers in the spring of 89. Well, one of them hid in that cupboard. We pulled him out with the heels. Quite interesting. But times have changed since then. Uh, so they have, Mr. Larrabee, so they have. But then it was only cracksmen, counterfeiters, pickpockets, and petty swindlers of various kinds. But now... Well, what now? Well, between you and me, Mr. Larrabee, we've heard some not altogether agreeable rumors. Rumors of some pretty shady work not far from here. Murder to a very peculiar kind. I've always had a suspicion. That's it. My surmise was correct. It is. It is what? This room is corked, sealed. What does that signify to us? Nothing to us, Mr. Larrabee. Nothing to us. But it might signify a good deal to some poor devil who's been caught and gassed in this trap. Well, if it's nothing to us, suppose we leave it alone and get to business. My time is limited. Yeah, of course. I should have realized that these reflections could not possibly appeal to you. Well, have a cigar, Mr. Holmes. Oh, thanks. Oh, good cigar, this, Mr. Larrabee. A genuine Havana. Glad you like it. Now, here is the little packet of letters which is the object of this meeting. I haven't opened it yet, but Miss Faulkner tells me everything is there. Now, I suppose, Mr. Larrabee, that as Miss Faulkner knows nothing about this affair, we omit her name from the discussion. What do you mean? Who told you she doesn't know? You did. Every look, tone, gesture, everything you've said and done since I've been in this room has informed me that Miss Faulkner has never consented to this transaction. It is a little speculation of your own. Oh, I suppose you think you can read me like a book. Oh, no, no, like a primer. Well, let it pass. How much will you give? A uh, thousand pounds. I couldn't take it. Uh, what do you ask? Five thousand. I couldn't give it. Well, I've been offered 4000 for this little Why packet. Why didn't you take it? Because I intended to get more. Oh, that's too bad. They offered 4000 They'll give five. They won't give anything. Why not? They've turned the case over to me. Hmm. Will you give 3000 Mr. Larrabee, strange as it may appear, my time is limited as well as yours. I have brought with me the sum of £1,000, which is all that I wish to pay. If it is your desire to sell at this figure, kindly surprise me of the fact at once. If not, permit me to wish you a very good evening. Well? You can have it. It's too small a matter to haggle over. Give me the money. Yes, certainly. Ah. I thought you said you'd only brought just a thousand. I did. This is it. You brought a trifle more, I see. Uh, quite so. I didn't say I hadn't brought any more. Oh, you can do your little tricks when it comes to it, can't you? It depends on who I'm dealing with. Yeah. You give me that money. Come on, quick. Hand it over. <coughs> ah! Let's go, Harry. Now. I've got you where I want you, James Larrabee. You've been so cunning and so cautious and so wise, we couldn't find a thing to hold you for, but this little slip will get you in for robbery. Uh, you'll have me in, will you? What are your views about being able to get away from here yourself? I do not anticipate any particular difficulty. Uh, robbery, eh? Why, even if you got away from here, you haven't got a witness. You haven't got a witness to your name. I'm not so sure of that, Mr. Larrabee. Not so sure of that. You usually fasten this cupboard door with a knife? Come away from that door! Faulkner! Oh. Stand back. 
contemptible scoundrel. What does this mean? I'll show you what it means, Captain. Quick. I'm afraid you're badly hurt, Miss Faulkner. Mr. Holt, look behind you. Stay. Hold it there, boy. Hold it. I'll uh, have to ask you gentlemen to wait just just one moment, please. Here, there. What's the idea of sitting down and writing? What are you writing? Writing your will, I suppose. No, no, only uh, a brief description of one or two of your gentlemen. The police. I'm ready now. Wait a bit. You better listen to me, Mr. Holmes. We're going to tie you down nice and tight to the top of that table. Why, you surprise me, gentlemen. Thinking you're so sure of anybody in this room. And three bars gone out of that window. Bars or no bars, you're not going to get out of here as easy as you expect. There are so many ways, Mr. Larrabee, that I hardly know which one to choose. Well, you better choose quick, I can tell you that. I'll choose at once, Mr. Cregan. And my choice falls on this chair. Oh my God! The light! Get away in the chair! Look out! Look out! Hey, guys! Look at it, Mr. Cregan! Look at the Look out! He's out of the window! He's up on the leg! He's climbed out! Look at his cigar! Get him quick! After him! There he goes! He's out! By the window! No, gentlemen, no, not by the window. I'm leaving by the door. Uh, by the way, I left my cigar for you on the windowsill. Good evening, gentlemen. There was no news of Holmes that night. And Billy reported next morning that he had not breakfasted at home. I had a busy morning at my office in Harley Street... It was after 11 before the last of my appointments was over. And still no news of Holmes. Did you uh, ring Dr. Watson? Oh, Parsons. Is there anyone waiting? I have to be in Baker Street at noon. There's one person in the waiting room, Doctor. A lady, sir, and she wants to see you most particular. Hey, what about? She didn't say, sir, only she said it was the most important to her if you would see her. Sir. Oh, very well, I'll see her and call a cab for me at the same time and have it wait. Show the lady in. Uh, yes, sir. Ah, oh, Doctor, it's awfully good of you to see me. I'm Mrs. H. DeWitt Seaton. Dear me, I didn't bring my card case. Well, if I did, I've lost it. Don't trouble about a card, Mrs. Seaton. They said you were Mr. Holmes' friend. Several people told me that, several. They advised me to ask you where I could find him today, this morning. And everything depends on it, Doctor, everything. I'd go to Mr. Holmes at once. But I've been. I've been and he wasn't there. You went to Mr. Holmes' house? Yes, in Baker Street. That's why I came to you. They said he might be here. No, he isn't here. But don't you expect him this morning? No, there's no possibility of Mr. Holmes coming, as far as I know. But couldn't you get him to come? It would be such a great favor to me. I'm almost worn out with going about him with this dreadful anxiety. If you could get word to Mr. Holmes to come... I could not get him to come, madam, and I beg you to excuse me. I'm going out myself on urgent business. I have no idea where Mr. Holmes could be. I... That Parsons? It sounded like a accident, sir. Probably nothing more than a broken-down hansom. Uh, see what it is, Parsons. Well, that's the bell, sir. Somebody's hurt, sir, and they're wanting you. Well, don't allow anybody to come in. I have no more time. Very well, sir. But they're coming in, Doctor. Let the old man come in, sir. Yes, yeah. yeah, bring him in. There ain't nowhere else for him to go. Can't the doctor's off his business and he can't come in when he's there. The doctors can't see anybody. He's got to come in. We can't leave him out in the street, can we? All right, help him in, Parsons. Oh, doctor, isn't it frightful? Can I be of some use? Not whatever, not whatever. But, doctor, I must see the poor fellow. Oh, my leg, my leg. Uh, right this way, sir. Uh, be careful of the sill, sir. Uh, uh, that's it. The accident. Oh. You can't help the accident. Oh, you can't. That's plain enough. He was on the wrong side of the street, he was. And now, over to the street. No, no, I'll sit here. Uh. No, 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 this is the chair, sir. Uh, don't you suppose I know where I want to sit down? You'll sit down here. Well, that isn't the doctor. Uh, the doctor will have a look at you. Here's the doctor. Uh, that isn't the doctor. Yes, it is a doctor. Here, doctor. Uh, you just come and have a look at this old bloke, will you? He's hurt himself a little then. Uh, are you a cabman? Yes, I'm the cabman. Well, I'll have you arrested for this. Arrested? Arrested, arrested, arrested. You can't arrest me. No, I can't, but somebody else can. Where's my hat? Where's my hat? My hat! My hat! Never mind your hat. I will mind my hat, and I'll hold you responsible. There's your hat in your hand. Go on, sit down. That isn't my hat. Here, you're responsible. I'll have you arrested. Here, come back. I'll go and stick around here. You know, i got to go and attend to my uh, feet and all. Bring your horse in here. I want to speak to him. I... Uh, let us say I won't stay in this place. If I ever get out of here alive... What are you staring at me for, lady? Parsons, tell that cab to wait for me. I must oh. see if he's badly hurt. Uh, yes, sir. Now, my oh. friend, if you'll sit quiet for one moment, I'll have a look at you. No. Well, stay still, will you? 
Well, how can I... Remarkable, remarkable weather we're having, eh, Doctor? Holmes, what on earth? How about having me remove some of this ridiculous disguise, Watson? Holmes, is that you? Uh, Quite so, my dear fellow, quite so. Holmes! Watson, Watson, only get out that window. Look out, the blind! What do you want me to do? Nothing. It's already been done by Mrs. Larrabee here. Look out, Holmes. She can get out that way. I don't think so, Watson. Foreman! I got it, sir. Good work, Foreman. I'll take this lady in charge. Yes, sir. Very good, Foreman. Wait for me outside. Yes, sir. Ah, oh, Watson, my dear fellow, I regret to say that up to the present time, Professor Moriarty himself has not risen to the bait. Where do you think he is? In the open streets, under some clever disguise. Watching for a chance to get at me. And was this woman sent in here? Quite to... so, quite so. A spy. To let them know by some signal... Oh. If she found me in the house, now they know. Pull down that blind, Watson. I don't care to be shot at from the street. I imagine we shall hear from Professor Moriarty very soon now. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! What did I tell you? He's come, sir. From where? The house across the street. He was in there watching these windows. He must have seen something, for he's just come out. There was a cab waiting in front of this house, sir. And he's climbed up and changed places with the driver. Get out again quick, Billy, and keep your eye on him. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Watson? You let me have a rather heavy portmanteau for a few moments. I won't do it any harm. Parsons, my large gladstone over there in the corner. Bring it here, please. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Here you are, sir. Here's the portmanteau. Uh, thank you, Parsons. Put it down there. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, Parsons, you wanted a cab for the doctor a short time ago. It's been waiting, I believe. Yes, sir. I think it has, sir. Be so good as to tell the driver to come in here and get a release. When he comes, tell him that's the one. Uh, very good, sir. My dear Watson times like these, you should tell your man never to take the first cab that comes on call, nor yet the second. The third may be safe. But Holmes, I... All right, my cabby, my cabby. Yes, his cabby, he arrived right in this way. Ah, this bag. I want taken down, uh... All right, you are, right. Uh, all right, uh, goodbye, Watson. Bye, Watson, old fellow. Uh, wait a minute, driver. Pretty heavy, I'm afraid. Let me help you. Uh, Watson, I'll write to you from Budapest. Yes, yes, but Holmes... Uh, here, driver. Let me... Tighten up these straps a bit. There we are. That's right. I'll hold it, driver. You you pull the strap. A few little things in this bag that I wouldn't like to lose. Won't you, won't you? And it's just as well to make quite sure. Is it not, Professor Moriarty? By means of a simple pair of handcuffs. Blast you, Holmes. Do you imagine, Sherlock Holmes, that this is the end? I... Ventured to dream that it might be. Are you quite sure the police will be able to hold me? Professor Moriarty, I'm quite sure of nothing. Take him away, Foreman. And so, my dear Watson, ends the strange case of Miss Alice Faulkner. Well, what about the letters? Oh, the letters. They were returned to their rightful owner over an hour ago. I suspected from the start that Miss Faulkner was really a nice girl at heart. Ah, dear. What is it, Holmes? I was just reflecting, my dear Watson. With Moriarty out of the way, London, from the point of view of the criminal expert, it's likely to become a singularly uninteresting city. One's morning paper, veritable wilderness of boredom. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Billy? There's a lady, sir. Been waiting for an hour. Says she's got to see you, sir. Case of murder, she says. She's got a face veil. From which I deduce that she is a lady of over 41 and less than 45, of a strange, dark beauty and considerable social eminence, and that she has lived for some years in the Near East, and that she is now wearing a large blood ruby on the second finger of her left hand. Holmes, how do you know these things? It's amazing. Huh. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. The child's play of deduction. Again tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System, through its affiliated stations coast to coast, has brought you Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air. The twelfth production in this unique series featuring Broadway's and radio's most celebrated theatrical producing company. This evening, the play was Orson Welles' own adaptation of William Gillette's Sherlock Holmes. In the cast, Dr. Watson, played by Ray Collins, 
Alice Faulkner by Mary Taylor, Madge Larrabee by Brenda Forbes, James Larrabee by Edgar Barrier, Inspector Foreman by Morgan Farley, Cragen by Richard Wilson, Brassick by Alfred Shirley, Larry by William Allen, Billy by Arthur Anderson, Professor Moriarty by Eustace Wyatt, and Sherlock Holmes by Orson Welles. The orchestra was conducted by Bernard Herman, and the production was supervised for CBS by Davidson Taylor. Your announcer is Frank Gallup. Thank <laughs> you.